Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here for the uh, Country Licks in Style class. Uh, we're going to be looking at some ideas that I have uh, gathered over the years of listening to country fiddle and talking to other musicians in the field and asking sort of uh, how they've thought about it. Uh, sometimes people say things like, you know, if they've played the music their whole life, they may say something like, oh, I don't know, I just kind of play what I hear. I, I, you know, it's like very natural. And then there's other people who are maybe, um, who maybe came to it later or maybe just more analytical about it. And I've gotten some pretty good answers from some people. And then there's some other answers that I came up from myself after having listened to a lot of music, realizing that there's some commonalities in the music that I really enjoy. So we're going to be looking at a combination of, uh, of tips that I've been given from other people that I'd like to share with you and other ideas. It's going to be heavy on playing, so make sure you have your instrument. My hope is to demonstrate the four basic ideas that we're going to be working on in this class first, and then we'll dive into practicing each of them in two keys. All right, so you saw in the description the first musical idea that uh, I wrote. I got from this um, Texas fiddler who was up at the Ashokan Center. He was teaching at the Western Swing Week, and I asked him, what are you thinking about when you're playing backup, when you're playing country fiddle? And he said, he gave a really good answer. He said, he said, Austin, there's, there's uh, all these other instruments in the band are playing. The bass is playing the root. The guitar or piano is usually playing the root. The third and the fifth is like a regular chord. Uh, sometimes even the seven, right? But the note that's not often played by the rhythm section are uh, the most juicy and colorful, he said. And he said, so I always aim to play those juicy and colorful notes. And the ones that he said he aims for are the sixth, what are called the sixth and the ninth. So that sounds like this. If I were to play the sixth over each of these chords, it sounds like this. idea I played, I started on those notes that this Texas fiddler told me to, to uh, emphasize. Now, if I'm, you know, playing really musically, I'm not going to overdo it and play that every time. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't play the same one every time, but I have practiced quite a bunch um, practicing this specific idea of aiming for target notes that are not in the chord, but sound really swingy over the chord. So that's going to be one of the focuses of today is to practice aiming for those more colorful swingy sounding notes in our improvisations and we'll do that in two keys. Uh, but the other three ideas I'd like to look at are uh, playing suspensions. So a suspension is just when you're playing a note that's not in the chord but it's uh, very close to a note that's in the chord so you have this temporary tension and it's resolved um, it's resolved by coming downward. So that sounds like something like this. You can do it with one note or two notes. So here's like one note. either with one or two notes. 
And then the other thing I want to touch on is this basic uh, basic scale that you could use either over all the chords or you can switch. That's called the major blues scale. So if I were making a solo or if I were just playing licks in between, it's often coming from this scale. So here's some ideas from that scale. So what I played there was all the D major blues scale, which you can do a lot uh, for just kind of noodling around on. You can do the same thing where you switch scales based on the chord, but we probably won't do that today. And as you can see, there's so much you can do with just the home scale. So that was just the D uh, major blues scale over all the chords. And then final thing I want to talk about is working with a singer, working with a singer being able to kind of echo musical ideas that they sing, so like this. And my soul is upside down When I get that low down feeling I know the blues must be someplace around You play this you got the same thing the right that the singer sings day by day. Get out your Or just respond foot. to them Get out on your knees and pray You're gonna Going to need my help one of these days. <laughs> You're going to be sorry you treated me this way. So you can kind of play the same as, as, as what they played or something influenced by what they played. So that's the idea of call and response with a singer or even another instrument. Those are the four main things I'd like to dive into today. So let's start with the first one I talked about which is um, color, uh, aiming for the notes that are not in the chord, that are these color tones that people call, like, uh, and that's the sixth and the ninth are the, are the, uh, the notes that have the most flavor uh, to them. So what we're gonna do is use our fiddle to guide us into hearing this sound first, and then we're gonna try to sing it. So let's start with visually, if we look at I'm going to share my screen here. We'll work on the key of D first. I think that's a little bit easier. All right, so if I share my screen, this is a, a regular D blues. It's a little bit more advanced towards the end here, but we can sort of ignore that. The idea here is that we want to think about the sixth note of each of these scales. So the sixth note of D is a B note. All right, so we can play a B note over the D chord over the G chord, the sixth note of a G scale. That's an E note. Over an A chord, we play an F sharp. And then we're just gonna pretend like both of this is A and, and this is all D. So that they, they played like a more advanced version of the last four bars. Usually this is two measures of A and uh, two measures of D. So we'll just kind of ignore these extra chords here. But let's try doing that together. So I'll call out the note. First finger on the A string is to start. Oops. And let's just do like a simple rhythm, like da da da, da da da, like that. Now play an E note as an elephant. Back to B. And let's just take a little break for the weird chords, right? One more time there, a B note over the D chord. Now an E note. A B note. Improvised rhythms on a B note. An E note. B. F sharp. Nice. Now let's 
use the suspension or the uh, color note and the note under it. Now E note. Back to B. F sharp. B. Idea. Repeat after me. Ba da dee da. Ba da ba da da. Bum ba da. Ba ba do. Ba do dee da. Bum ba da da. Ba ba dee dee da. Da dee dee da. Now using those notes, see if you can just make some ideas up. This academic idea, right, playing the sixth note of the scale, we were very, um, very mathematical and academic about it, right? But the end goal was to take this idea that exists as a musical concept, play it on our instrument until we can hear it enough to start singing it and playing around with it. Then it becomes uh, a part of our our ourselves. It becomes a a part. It comes out naturally in our improvisation, and we start to hear it. And so it becomes, it moves from this academic idea to intuition. But we used our fiddle to help hear that note first. So um, that's a really good strategy and just kind of proof of how we can bring a very academic sounding concept to uh, something that we start to hear naturally and play more naturally. Let's do the same thing now with the ninth note of each scale. So if we looked at again at the chords for this little chart here, the ninth note one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. A lot of people would ask, well, why don't you just call it the second note? That's a great question. Um, I think it should be called the second note. That would be a lot easier to remember it. Uh, and the only reason why a lot of people call it the ninth is because it was a language that came out of a, 
um, pianists and guitarists who would often play that note um, after having already played a bunch of notes under it. So they'd play the root, the third, the fifth, the seventh, and the ninth. So it became like... To them, it was like the, the ninth note because they're playing like all the notes, you know what I mean? So that anyway, that's why the language of nine came out instead of, instead of two because you notice that E note is the same as the second note, right? Anyway, you could, the easier way to think about this is um, to just play one note above what you actually see. And then you'll get the same kind of sense for that. So let's, let's do that as we look at it a couple times through. Just play the note above what you see. Now an A note above G. E note. Sharp, or sorry, B note. And we can kind of break for that part there. One more time playing the note above what you see. A note. Let's do that a little practice on that without looking at it now. Um, repeat after me. Good work on that. So same idea, we take a very academic concept, we play it, we practice it with our instrument, we use the instrument to help uh, get that sound further in our brain. And then once we have that sound in our brain, we can start to sing it so it becomes more intuitive, more part of what we naturally hear and uh, more part of what naturally comes out of our impro improvisation and our musical ideas. A lot of people approach this music with a combination of intuition and um, and thinking, you know, somewhat of theory. Some people who have played this music their whole life can play entirely on intuition. Some people can do either, and they choose to do one or the other. And a lot of people choose to do a combination of both. I think everything's good, um, but if you didn't grow up playing it, you might not be able to rely completely on intuition. Uh, and hopefully you could see that, uh, that this kind of academic approach, you can bring it into intuition. So, um, that is that idea. I want to very quickly maybe practice that in one other key, and then we'll move to this next musical concept. So here's the key of G. We just played the ninth. Why don't we practice that? So play the note above what you see. Here's an A note, the ninth of A. Any octave, 
And now let's very quickly think about the sixth note of each scale. That might take a little bit more thought here. So the sixth of a G scale is an E note. The sixth of a C scale is an A note. And the sixth of the D scale is a B note. So that might be a little bit more challenging. Let's start with an E note. Get ready to play an A note. that perfectly but hopefully you get the idea that we have these target notes for the beginning of our musical phrase that all of a sudden just like sounds more in the character of the music because it has that um, 
that floaty element that the fiddle can kind of add to this kind of music, you know, we're, we're trying to add to what's not there. And uh, that element is kind of what, uh, it's one of the things that defines the style of the music is the usage of those notes and things like that. So uh, let's move on to our next idea here, which is the idea of a suspension. Now, uh, a suspension, what we were doing is essentially a suspension. You're playing a note that's not in the chord and you're kind of, ho it gives this hovering feeling right above it. And then like you're resolving down. Uh, so really a suspension, just the general idea of a suspension is when you pick a note that's above an actual chord note and uh, you hold it there and eventually resolve it. A suspension means that you're just playing that note. Uh, but traditionally, like the most common types of suspension are actually the fourth scale degree going to the third. So that's what I was kind of demonstrating before on uh, like... can sound like that where you start a musical idea from it um, or it could be like double stops I like doing suspensions like something like this idea there. Um, that's that's basically aiming for an, yet another, this kind of goes back to that Texas fiddler that, you know, told me about this sort of stuff. He's always aiming for notes that are not in the chord and kind of creating temporary tension and then um, resolving it. So it's that idea that's kind of like the blues, swing, jazz kind of element of this, um, you know, tension, momentary tension and resolution and things like that. So, uh, basically the idea of a suspension, it really is any note above a chord tone resolving down to a chord tone, but the one that we're focusing on right now that's different from the last two that we did is the fourth note of the scale. Um, and so the fourth note of a D scale is G. Right? So if you know your D arpeggio, if you just play a G note and then do something D arpeggio bit wise, Right? It like we create tension. Right? That's the idea of using a suspension momentarily then resolving it to uh, to that. So anyway, let's let's try that. We've got the a G note here, we've got a C note here. And uh, for A I guess we have a D note. So we'll just slow this down. This one's like a little bit more racking for the brain or whatever. <laughs> It's late in the fiddlehead day. Okay, so we're going to start with a G note. Now a C note. idea after you play the G note. Now a C note. A G idea. G. D 
note. <laughs> the G note. Anyway, there's a lot of chord changes in this. This might be a little bit more challenging. And now like a C note. So hopefully you can kind of hear the general sound of that. Let's sing a little bit of it. Five chords is a little bit weird, but let's keep trying it one more time, singing it through. Be do di da da, be da da do di, ba da bo do, ba do di da, ba da da do, ba da da. Yeah, cool. All right, we'll end that there. Um, and that will probably kind of wrap up what I wanted to talk about with like targeting notes that are a little bit more uh, flavorful than the root, the third, and the fifth. So we've got really the sixth of the chord, the ninth of the chord, and the fourth. All of those have a lot more flavor and they're not being pl played by the other players. So if you start your musical idea there and then kind of s settle into the chord, Right afterwards, that's sort of how we create that natural tension and resolution that like makes us kind of have that general feel for this music. So um, those are there. Um, I wanted to add to that. Yeah, before we get into call and response, one other thing that I want you to be aware of that's super cool. This is um, for some of you who have been following uh, my work. You, you might have seen this me share this document before. This is kind of where I, I like talk about the order of things I suggest working on uh, and the order of things that I personally have worked on. And so I have like, we didn't talk about double stops too much, but I have this list of like just regular double stops, right? And that happens before you learn this cool thing that I've been, I'm going to write out soon called swingy double stops. So I have regular double stops, which sound like this. D. Uh, regular double stops, like notes that are in the chord, sound like this. Not too much color. Then I have bluesy double stops, which are written out. Those sound like this. Let me speed this up a little bit more. I guess you don't need to be, well, I do want to show you. Yeah, I mean, the bluesy double stop. What I just played looks like this, which are nice. It's a good foundation. These are like regular double stops, the root, the third, and the fifth in the chord. But hitting, talking about like colorful notes, right? I have written out this idea of playing, um, oh, I have, I have it written somewhere. Maybe it's down here. Uh, 
Anyway, it's written out like that. It looks sort of like that. And it and it tells you where all the, uh, the bluesy sounding colorful notes are. That sounds like this. That's a cool set of uh, bluesy double stops that I wrote out. What I have not yet to write out is something that I'm really personally excited about. It's uh, another set of double stops that I call the swingy double stops. And that sounds like this. basically playing like I'm pretending like the chord is minor basically such a great set of sounds that's really inspiring to practice if you like double stops um, so I've yet to write that out but if you follow my you know YouTube channel or or um, my uh, website you'll probably see that eventually in the next like three to six months or something um, and if you like and play this music a lot it's really fun to practice these swingy double stops for those of you who are more theory minded and would like to like get a jump on it what I'm basically doing there is when I see a D chord, I play the double stop um, associated, uh, well, okay. So when I see a D chord, I play a B minor double stop. When I see a G chord, I play an E minor double stop. When I see an A chord, I play an F sharp minor double stop. Where are those random, you know, opposite chords coming from? They're all the relative minor. So if you've like heard of the relative minor scale, like on a piano, right? C the C note, uh, all the white keys are C major and A minor, right? So, um, you know, every note has a relative minor. Every, you know, chord or uh, scale has a relative minor. And so essentially what I just did is I played the relative minor arpeggio double stops for every chord. And that's how I, you got those really cool sounds. But anyway, we're not going to go into that today because I don't have the PDF and it's a little bit more advanced. What I do want to get into is... Um, the major blues scale and then call and response. So uh, I have talked a lot about the major blues scale and I've got a lot of stuff on my YouTube channel. I have them all written out and things like that. But I figured just uh, to remind, or I figured we can get playing a little bit on it just so you can kind of see the magic of just staying in one scale really for the entire song. Whenever you get lost, it's a really great idea. So the I'll give you two major blues scales. One is this one. <laughs> All right, so play that one there. It's a, I'll uh, play through it several times with a, with a backing track. Okay. All right, so it's just a pentatonic scale the flat third. So I'll play some musical ideas that use that scale and you'll just see the power of it, you know, in your improvisation and things like that. Okay.
go ahead and use this scale on your own for about a minute. If you're more advanced, play extended range. So all the notes of that scale across the instrument. Now if you combine using this, uh, if you combine using the scale just noodling on it with some knowledge of what we talked about before, you can have musical ideas start on that target kind of colorful note and then end on notes from the major blues scale. So for example. as well uh, once we kind of incorporate all of them together. So that's the major blues scale and it's worth learning in the four possible ways you can play it on fiddle, which are the way uh, open string, first finger, second finger, and third finger. And if you learn those four finger patterns, you can play them everywhere. I do have those written out and I'll uh, put a link to that um, in the chat here. But I do want to get to our last topic here. Um, there we go. Uh, I want to get to our last topic here, which is call and response of being, you know, playful with the singer. Um, let's look at this song, Brain Cloudy Blues, here. <laughs> of A, so let's use that scale that we were just practicing, just starting on the A string instead. Just noodle on that for a little bit on your own. Just get the notes under your fingers. Maybe play it down the octave. When I get that old down feeling, I know the blues must be someplace around. I hear you, baby. You got to treat me right, honey, day by day. Get out your little prayer book. Get out on your knees and pray. You're gonna need, going to need my help one of these days. <laughs> You're going to be sorry you 
treated me this way. Cool. So now that we've got that sound in our head, let's just talk about um, playing along with the sync. So what I want you to try here is to um, play any musical idea the beat after the singer finishes their musical idea. So like this. So kind of we're keeping the beat. If you don't know the song, this is a great strategy. Wait for the singer to finish and play on the beat after them. Like this. My brain is cloudy. My soul is upside down. That low down feeling, I know the blues must be someplace around. I hear you, Jason. You got to treat it right, but it day by day. Get out your yeah. prayer book, get out on your knees and pray. God gonna need, going to need my help one of these days. You're going to be sorry you treated me Suspension. this way. You can pretend like the instrument playing a solo is a singer. interplay with the singer very fun to practice very fun to do live with real people because you can actually listen to the words that they're saying and you can respond to them sometimes there's even things that you can play that kind of like hint at what the words like if they said something bluesy or if they said something funny you can kind of imitate that on your instrument but that sort of sensitivity and uh, you combining it with the elements that we talked about before can make you a really great player in like a country band where you're you know, playing, you're weaving in and out of a singer who's kind of like, you know, taking the main uh, spotlight for most of the time. So you want to like highlight that and like provide pillows for their, <laughs> for their singing. So anyway, we did the beat after. If you're more familiar with the song, you can kind of like jump on the sentence a little bit more and play on the same beat that they uh, sing. So, or on the same beat that they finish. So it sounds like this. You can also wait 
Uh, you can do it like in the space in between when they finish. You could also mimic exactly what they sing or the shape of what they sing. I'll try both of those. Go ahead and try singing exactly or play exactly what they sing. Actually, not perfect at that. Going to, need, going to need my, going to need my. There it is. So that can be a little bit more challenging to play exactly what they sing, but it's certainly a great challenge if you're in practice mode. Um, but the point is, though, that you don't need to worry about playing exactly what they play. It's more about the interplay between you and the singer. You can steal their melodic or their rhythmic ideas. So another thing to try that's a little bit more achievable is to play the same rhythm that they play, but don't worry about getting the notes right. So that would be like this. My brain is cloudy, my soul is upside down. Down. So that's what he played. <laughs> when I get that low down feeling, I know the blues must be someplace around. Uh, here you go, right, different notes, same rhythm. You got to treat me right, honey, day by day. Get out your little prayer book, get out on your knees and pray. God gonna need. Going to need my help one of these days. <laughs> You're going to be sorry you treated me this way. <laughs> so anyway, that's a great practice to play. Try to play maybe echoing the singer, but don't worry about getting the right notes. Just be within these like the general musical color which I was, you know, it's mostly like the blues scale, right, that we talked about. And uh, between that and mimicking the rhythm, you'll, you'll sound like you're really kind of interacting in a nice way. So to wrap things up here, those, those are the four musical ideas that I, want to talk, that I wanted to talk to you about, which in review were um, aiming for colorful notes, mostly the six and the nine the sixth of the scale and the ninth of the scale. Then we talk about suspensions, which the sixth and the ninth is technically suspension, uh, but the you know, the most typical suspension is the four. Um, after that, we went to the major blues scale, which is a great um, just general sound to use for your improvisation and for your little fills and things like that. It's the, where the construction of a lot of these improvisations are. And then finally, we ended on this column response practice, which is you know being really sensitive to what the singer is trying to imitate them, but not necessarily having to do the same notes. You could do the same rhythms. Uh, interspersed with that was this little, uh, uh, well, some ideas from this document here. That This is a blog post I have called How to Practice Creatively. So feel free to check that out. Um, and then what I'm gonna, the last thing I'm gonna uh, share in the chat here is if you're interested in following my nerdy fiddledom, uh, when I first quit my public school orchestra teaching job, every week I was like sending out like ex things that excited me about fiddle. And um, that's now like an 100 page ebook that I, I have somewhere on my website that um, that's, was a really cool project. But I still, mostly every other week now, send out fiddle tips and little fiddle uh, tidbits of inspiration. Uh, that uh, you can sign up for in the chat, which I just posted. 
Um, but I want to end on a uh, uh, appreciative note. I'm so grateful for Fiddle Hell in general. Uh, I've learned so much of what I know today from attending Fiddle Hell for like 10 years now and things like it. So if you're, if you're here, you're in the right spot. This is exactly how I learned. Most of what I know is going to like fiddle camps and things like that. Uh, you know, I played classical music in college. So all this fiddle stuff you can learn by hanging out at Fiddle Hell. Thanks for being here. My name is Austin Scalzo. Check me out on YouTube. Check me out on my website. There's a lot of free stuff on YouTube and blogs and stuff like that. Hope you had a great time. Um, and see you around.